and thank you for staying so late for this presentation. I know that these are very long days, uh, and we would probably all rather be going and uh, having a beer and something to eat and then going to bed. But thank you for making the time to stay up a little bit longer for us. Um, we are going to hold this event to discuss SIPA in the flyways, uh, and we have some esteemed colleagues who will be joining us for that. Uh, and then we will be presenting the first round of Wetland Center Awards, the Star Awards. It's the first time we've done it, so we're very excited to be giving out 23 awards to uh, great wetland centers uh, across the world. Um, I don't see a presentation yet, um, but I'm hoping my colleague Connor, who is eagerly on site in the UK, will be able to share the presentation on screen. Yeah, otherwise I can stand up and dance. Oh, I see. Right. No, I'm not sure that he wants to do that. Um, Connor, do you hear us? <laughs> hey, excellent. Okay, let's go. So, what is a wetland centre? My uh, main gig is normally about wetland centres, so I will talk about those first. Um, Connor, do you want to go to slide one? Sorry, and I'll just uh, announce who's here. So, not just me. Um, we have a very quick presentation from a few people, um, and you can see them listed here. They will present themselves uh, as they come up. And thank you uh, to Connor, who, as I say, is in the UK. Um, next slide, please. So what's a wetland centre? Um, we have a few pictures of different wetland centres ranging from uh, this very large one, uh, built wetland centre in uh, Canada, uh, Oak Hammock, uh, to uh, smaller wetland centres um, which exist primarily on site. They don't really necessarily have uh, any infrastructure like the one here in Benin on top left. Um, the Penang seagrass one down here is about going out to communities to talk to them about wetlands. Um, and uh, the one here, which I think is Finland, um, is a great example of kind of a viewing platform uh, to allow people to really experience the wetland at close hand. Uh, next slide, please. So how does this fit with Ramsar? What have wetland centres got to do with Ramsar? We've all been talking a lot over the last few days about different uh, resolutions. One of those is the SEPA resolution their communication, capacity building, education, participation, and awareness. Um, and really, you know, wetland centers are one of the key tools to get that uh, resolution delivered on the ground. There's a lot of talk about how we communicate wetlands, but wetland centers are a great forum uh, to do that. And we've held uh, some pre-COP workshops to talk about SEPA and fed that in uh, to, to the SEPA approach here. Next slide, please. Key areas of work then for Wetland Link International and Wetland Centres, we work largely through regional networks. We're not just uh, in the UK uh, producing stuff, but we work through lots of partners and you'll hear from some of them uh, tonight who will explain a little bit more about that. We have a website which has details on all of our members and all their profiles, and we do regular communications through our bulletins, through our webinars. Uh, and through resources and guidance that we produce, but also that we work with our partners to produce as well. There's lots of links there uh, to flyways and other initiatives. Uh, and we also have uh, an assistant role. Every year we have a paid internship role, which allows us to give the opportunity to someone in different parts of the world. They do it from a uh, remote location, but work with us to help develop our approach to really broaden uh, our understanding of what's happening in flyways. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass you over uh, to Mr. Sir, who is going to talk to you a little bit about Welly Asia Oceania. Um, Mr. Sir has been a great colleague, and he and his team uh, have been super helpful in developing uh, the network in this area of the world. So let me pass you over to Mr. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Am I getting the award here? <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this uh, meaningful uh, uh, side event. Uh, and then also it's an honor to introduce uh, the activity of Ramsa Region Center East Asia and uh, really Asia Oceania. So uh, Ramsa Regional Center East Asia is a, a regional capacity building platform. We work with the 18 countries in the Eastern part of Asia, which is located in uh, Korea. How can next I? Slide. Next slide. Okay, uh, we uh, began to our begin our work with uh, Willy uh, since 2016. So we signed an MOU on the 
on your right, right side. Uh, 2016, we signed firstly, uh, signed an MOU with uh, uh, Willy Global. And we took the, we, from that moment, we played a role as a secretary for the Willy Asia. And then uh, we organized, uh, uh, currently, uh, later, uh, we renewed our uh, MOU in 2019, and then also uh, 2022. For the last renewal, uh, we have uh, very good news. We uh, uh, expanded our, our uh, coverage uh, from Asia to Oceania. So now uh, we work with the, uh, Oceania. So we call it uh, from really Asia to really Asia Oceania. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great work. <laughs> And then uh, currently we have 85 uh, member wellness centers and 15 in the 15 countries. And then we all keep organizing the biennial uh, Really Asia conference since Really Asia 5. And it was in 2015. Before we signed the MOU with the Really Global, we uh, cooperated with the Really and then we organized one uh, uh, Really Asia uh, conference. And then uh, the, the number ended uh, Really Asia 8. And then we will uh, restart really as really Oceania. So uh, the first really Asia Oceania conference is planned to be held in uh, where is uh, Ironman, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, the Asaru Wetland Park. So we will organize in 2024 uh, in uh, Sri Lanka. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the photos uh, from uh, our really Asia uh, conferences. On your right top, uh, that's the, the really Asia five uh, in twenty. Oh, can you click again? Oh no no no, go back go back. Sorry sorry. So really Asia five and really Asia six in Saka, really Asia seven, really Asia seven in Taipei, and then really Asia eight. We we had a uh, two really really uh, Asia eight part one part two, part one in the middle of a pandemic uh, through the virtual means. And then also, we, uh, finally, we could have a uh, uh, really Asia eight uh, in the Philippines this year. And then also, uh, like I mentioned, we renewed our uh, MOU with the global, uh, and then also we uh, work with the uh, Oceania region. Next slide, please. This is uh, what we are, what we have done uh, so far. Uh, from uh, since to twenty, when when we uh, signed an, when we started work as a really Asia. We received a list, long list of uh, uh, really Asia member from the from Chris, but <laughs> it was all outdated. So uh, we could, we could not really uh, contact any any of them uh, at that moment. But we start to build up our try to build up our uh, uh, network through this work. So uh, we contacted uh, uh, wellness centers one by one, and we received the. Uh, uh, information from each wetland centers and the, uh, photos and then their programs, their structure, and then uh, uh, all necessary things. It, so uh, we put the, we, every wetland center here, about 50 wetland centers, we put about five pages about wetland centers. So others, uh, people, people can easily find where they are, what they do, and then how many people are visiting there. So this is uh, one, uh, one thing, it's a continuous work. So this is the first book we are updating. I mean, we are uh, preparing for the second book. So we will continuously work uh, on this. Next slide, please. And then also, uh, uh, so we need to strengthen our membership. So we, uh, before we, we didn't have any certificates on as a member to prove I am the member of the Willy Asia, but the, there was no certificate, no something visible. So we uh, created a certificate and then uh, we made a, a meta plate and then we uh, delivered to the really Asia member uh, members. So they were very happy with this. And then some uh, wetland centers, even mayor come and visit the wetland center and then took a photo of this. So uh, it's, uh, we are uh, making it really as a brand in the wetlands, uh, wetland centers. Next slide, please. And then also, uh, this is uh, the small program that we are running with the uh, uh, really Asian members. So uh, we uh, uh, asked, what, what do you want to do really in the uh, really Asian network? They said that they want to learn more about the other wellness centers. So what we can do, we, we uh, uh, pondered. Then uh, we uh, 
uh, spare some, I mean, some of the budget of our budget. And then we, uh, we uh, work with the, I mean, we invited uh, well, really Asian members. If you want to uh, learn more about the other wellness centers, not by the web, web page, if you want to really experience other wellness centers, please submit your uh, uh, application. It's a very small amount of money, but it can be, uh, it can work as a seed funding. So like uh, we give about $3,000 to each center for uh, for 10 centers, it's about $30,000. Uh, then uh, they uh, select what, where they want, they, they can go and they can experience. But the, the uh, report, the, their experience, what they've learned, uh, should be shared with the other wetland centers through our RCA uh, web magazine. And then another one, uh, uh, we really uh, uh, feel thankful for the uh, Korean uh, cosmetics company, uh, Amore Pacific Primera. Uh, they, gave, uh, they gave us a donation, uh, 30,000 a year. So we decided to put this money for the really. So uh, we uh, support, uh, we, we give grant, uh, it's very small amount, 10, a uh, million Korean one is a slightly less than uh, uh, ten thousand U.S. dollar, but uh, we give uh, we uh, receive the applications. We uh, select uh, good uh, applications and we support. Uh, we give grant uh, ten thousand to each, so three uh, grants to uh, every year for the really Asian members. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And then also we have a very good informal. Uh, um, continuous uh, communication channel in the WhatsApp. So uh, if there's any uh, event or anything promote in the in the members, so we simply can uh, so update it to the, and then if there's any question, we can simply uh, ask to each other. So it's quite active uh, means to communicate. And then thank you. <laughs> That's it, this is all I prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Sir. Um, really useful uh, to hear about what's going on in Welly Asia, Oceania. So we're going to move now uh, to EAAFP, uh, and we're going to hear from Vivian Fu, who will explain a bit about SEPA activities uh, in that flyway. Over to you, Vivian. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, it's a bit high for me, so I'm standing here. Um, yeah. Thank you, um, Chris and everyone for giving me the chance for introducing the SIPA approach for the EAFP. Um, so I'm the communication officer of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. It's a really long name. So you can call us EAAFP. So this is just uh, very briefly about our partnerships and you can see 39 of them. And um, we have government partners, intergovernmental organizations. So we are also one of the Ramsar regional initiatives and we have uh, international NGOs as partners and also very interestingly uh, working with private sector as well. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And um, the EAFP has um, uh, adopted a 10 year a strategic plan during our, uh, our last mob in 2018. And uh, as you can see, um, if you click one more, I don't know, it's, it's the sound control is so amazing. Um, that's uh, the second objective is actually to enhance SEPA for uh, of the value of migratory water birds and the habitats. So um, that's why we have the next slide that we have uh, launched the SEPA action plan for five years to achieve this objective. Um, this SEPA action plan is uh, uh, prepared by our SEPA working group and for the whole part, uh, partnership. And it specifically identify activities for each type of our partners for what they can do to achieve this, uh, to uh, implement the actions from this action plan of C for SEPA. And uh, Willie, H, uh, Willie, it's also included as uh, one of our um, uh, main activities because we have a flyway network site, which is going to the next slide, please. Uh, before that, I would like to introduce other than our 39 partners, we do have uh, like working a wide range with wide range of um, expertise. So um, they are from uh, like distributed into the working group and task, uh, work task forces. Um, 
specified on different um, issues like um, specific species or um, um, group that like SIPA working group. If you can click this one more, then you can show, yay. Um, the SIPA working group is led by um, Casey Burns uh, from the USFWS from Alaska and Chris, our vice chair of the SIPA working group. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the leadership that uh, we are actually revising our SIPA action plan, uh, which will be adopted in uh, our next month. So next slide, please. And yes, I mentioned about one of the main objective of EAFP is the flyway site network development. And these are important uh, sites for migratory water birds that, that are following the criteria of a Ramsar site and are this, uh, designated by the government partners. So they are uh, of international importance and are also recognized by the um, national governments. And under this flyway site network, which we now have uh, 152 sites, we also wanted to have closer bonding to them. So um, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so under this flyway network site, we do have a sister site agreement. So that two sites, um, two flyway network sites, if they have common interest that they can form this sister site relationship, and they can do whatever they like. For example, like joint uh, monitoring, they can have uh, meetings uh, like this one in the Inchong Hong Kong sister site program. Um, they uh, held a environmental education workshop for local educators uh, two months ago. So um, there are a lot of opportunities and flexibility for this um, uh, sister site uh, to work together. And we are also doing a guidelines for this um, new sister site uh, no, not new sister site, a new guidelines for this sister site uh, partnership. So next slide, please. And uh, one of the main key EAFP SIPA activities for our partners is to celebrate World Migratory Birthday, uh, which is now two times a year, um, second Saturday in May and in October. And uh, the EAFP also provides small grant fund for our partners and also non-partners within the EAF Flyway to apply for uh, a small grant fund to implement activities in the during the World Migratory Birthday. And we are also um, uh, doing the translation of the materials for this uh, for the World Migratory Birthday, at least for 13 to 14 uh, languages in the for this uh, uh, World Migratory Birthday materials. So next slide, please. And um, the youth, we have the youth <laughs> and the draft ref resolution for this, uh, for this COP. And so youth, although they're not yet mentioned in a strategic plan or SEPA action plan yet specifically, but we do treasure the youth uh, as uh, important stakeholders. So in 2020, uh, when the pandemic just started, we still go on with working with YEW, Youth Engaging Wetlands, to launch this first ever Flyway Youth Forum, and it was quite well received. We have over 140 people read, uh, joined it, um, like uh, from the youth, from the expertise, from other NGOs, and our government partners also joined. And to extend this spirit, um, we had received quite a good um, number of young people and interested in the conservation field here. So next step, we wanted them to do uh, implementation of the actions. So um, the past year and this year, we have organized a youth think tank competition for a flyway. And uh, next slide, please. The part ones uh, we, we uh, provide, uh, workshop, training workshop to build capacity on different topics for um, our youth in this flyway. So we organize the four uh, workshops. And then next slide, please. The second part of the Youth Think Tank competition is of course the competition itself. So um, thanks to our partners to uh, like Chris as a judge <laughs> and also um, Dr. Yu Bung Sik from uh, Rams uh, uh, Secretary has also become, uh, is our uh, judges to um, uh, help to select five um, uh, project proposal and they were given small amounts of funding uh, for them to implement for 10 months and eventually if you click 
Um, yes, so the winner went to a China team. So uh, actually there was a small mini um, ceremony in Wuhan because this is a Chinese team. So um, hopefully we will bring them more opportunity to um, join international event for them to um, implement, uh, to share what they have done. So uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Vivian. Um, you are a powerhouse of keeping all these things going. Um, very impressive. Um, next, I'm going to call on uh, Sergey, who will talk a little bit about the AWA SIPA network. We recently had the AWA MOP uh, in Budapest, um, which was a great opportunity to discuss that a bit more. But Sergey, over to you. Thanks a lot, Chris, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sergei Dereliev, and I'm Head of Science Implementation and Compliance. So I guess I'm in the wrong side event, <clears throat> but uh, I'm here actually to speak on behalf of my colleague Florian Kyle, who couldn't make it to, to the COP. And uh, we have only one slide, which Florian kindly put together, uh, so I'll keep my intervention short. So for those who are not uh, familiar with AVA, it's one of the flyway instruments uh, similar to the EFP. Uh, well, basically there are not many of us <laughs> around the world. And uh, unlike the, the partnership in, in the East Asian Installation Flyway, AVA is actually a legally binding treaty. And uh, for this reason, actually, um, we have SIPA as an obligation for the parties that have acceded to the agreement. So SIPA is not just recognized as something which is necessary, that's important. It's simply mandatory according to the legal text of the treaty. So there is a, a big strength in having uh, such a mandate. Uh, so parties are uh, uh, particularly directed to uh, provide training to all the personnel that is uh, involved in the implementation of the treaty to raise their capacity and also to uh, develop uh, and run programs uh, and uh, distribute materials to the general public to increase their awareness and knowledge of the issues uh, related to the conservation of migratory water birds. And being a legally binding treaty, uh, parties are actually uh, required to report uh, to the meeting of the parties on their SIPA activities. So for those who are interested, we could actually mine the national reports of the Ava parties and see what they're doing at national level or even at regional level. Um, next, I would like to mention the SIPA uh, focal point network. So we have basically followed the example of the Ramsar Convention and uh, we have started calling for designation of SIPA focal points in each contracting party. And the map that you see there uh, currently depicts uh, where we have active uh, SIPA focal points. And uh, as you can see, the African parties seem to be a bit more keen on SIPA than the European ones. Uh, currently, we have 45 designated uh, uh, SIPA focal points. They either come from the government or, or from non-governmental sector. So it's a, a very nice blend of, of experts that we have, and they're involved in, in the work that the agreement uh, undertakes in this respect. Um, relatively recently, the parties recognized the importance of having uh, expertise on SIPA in our scientific subsidiary body. It's called Technical Committee. It's the counterpart of the STRP in the Ramsar Convention. So in 2012, we, we received the mandate to include such an expert in, in the Technical Committee. And I'm really delighted to, to inform you that uh, at the last meeting of the parties, which Chris has mentioned, took place in Budapest less than two months ago, uh, that meeting appointed our own Chris Rostrum as the next uh, expert on SIPA in the Ava Technical <laughs> Committee. Exactly. That's actually the key point. Chris, Chris is everywhere. <laughs> so, well, Chris's responsibility will be not only to direct the, the work of the Technical Committee in advising parties how to implement SIPA, and uh, in fact, the agreement as a whole. But uh, our hope is that he can actually bring the link between the flyway initiatives, because as you said, uh, rightfully so, he's everywhere. So we basically expect there's nothing short of, of magic from you. <clears throat> 
Um, I would like to mention also one of our regional, well, it's actually currently the only regional initiative we have under the agreement. This is the African initiative. It has an operational document, which is called Plan of Action for Africa, based on the strategic plan of the agreement. And it, was, and it puts strong emphasis on capacity building. And uh, over the years, the, under the African initiative, uh, we have um, implemented several training for trainers events. And there's uh, currently one in the making for the small uh, island development states in the Indian Ocean that will take place in Mauritius next year. And these trainings are based on the so-called flyway training kit, which is a specifically designed uh, a training manual for AVA, which was developed uh, more than 10 years ago in the framework of uh, a large project funded by the Global Environmental Facility, which was called Wings Over Wetlands and involved a, a large number of partners, some of which might be actually even in this room. So we are still act actively using the flyway training kit, particularly for capacity building of professionals uh, and personnel in, in Africa and in other parts of the agreement area. And last but not least, uh, let me mention uh, let me mention the flyway. Uh, sorry, the World Migratory Bird Day campaign, which is uh, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, SIPA uh, initiative that the uh, AVA Secretariat is running. It started uh, as an initiative from the AVA Secretariat back in 2006, and we actually promoted it and further developed it with the Convention on Migratory Species, and. Uh, it's one of the of the most important SIP opportunities on the global environmental calendar nowadays. And it's, as uh, Vivian already said, it's celebrated twice a year. And uh, we're very glad to acknowledge the, the great collaboration we had with the Environment for the Americas and the uh, East Asian Australia Flyway Partnership Secretariat in this respect. And also the great work that the Wildland Wetlands Trust and Wetland International have been doing in promoting and celebrating this event. So I'll conclude on this and just to say that we see a great opportunity here, especially with Chris being everywhere, to, <clears throat> to actually synergize across flyways, not just along flyways, just across flyways, so we could learn from each other. And we're already doing that, but uh, I think there is uh, a lot of uh, unutilized opportunity there. So looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei. Um, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to live up to your expectations. Uh, next, we're going to hear uh, from someone who has joined us online. So Susan Bonfield from Environment for the Americas, uh, I'm hoping is on Zoom. Uh, and she will give us a, a little rundown of some of the uh, SIPA activities. Um, I just ask presenters to uh, make sure they stick to time uh, to make sure that we uh, get there, get to the end. All right. So, Susan, can you hear us? I sure can. Great. We can hear you. So over to you. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me here today or this evening for all of you and Chris. You know, you're everywhere, but I haven't even met you in person yet, so I guess it's time you head over to where we are in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I'm really excited and to meet all of you virtually, and uh, I think some other speakers already set the stage for what I'm going to talk about, so I'll just add a little bit of information. Um, I'm Susan Bonfield. I'm the Director of Environment for the Americas. And we coordinate World Migratory Bird Day in the Americas region. Our team is an amazing one, and they are what make it so successful. Um, we have staff who work in our base office in Boulder, Colorado, as well as staff who work in Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. Uh, we believe that um, our representatives in these regions are really well able to work with the communities and people and wetland centers and other locations where we need to help protect habitats for birds and also to um, prevent their decline. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, we work around the world in partnership with the Convention on Migratory Species and the African Eurasian Water Bird Agreement, also with Vivian, the AAFP. So I, I wish I could be there in person to join all of you. Um, but you can see how it's basically laid out in terms of our regions of focus. And of course, you know, birds, birds go where they want and where they migrate. So there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, but our goal is to work across the flyways to raise awareness of migratory birds and the importance of protecting, uh, protecting them and 
raising awareness also about the factors that threaten their populations. So it's quite a big campaign each year. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. And one of the, at the heart of World Migratory Bird Day has always been the World Migratory Bird Day poster. And we established our partnership in 2018. So you can see that some of the posters actually say International Migratory Bird Day, which is what it was called in the Americas before we all joined forces around the globe. Um, but these are just some of the examples of the posters that we've had in the past. Um, what you can see from the posters is that we always include wetland species, uh, birds that depend on water in these, sometimes more specifically than others. For example, when we took on restore habitat, restore birds, and other times in terms of the threats that wetlands may face, such as the year that we focused on plastic pollution. But we are always considering the different habitats that birds need, and of course, birds need, and of course, um, during their life cycle, you know, the vast majority of birds need some source of water at all times, and wetlands are critical. Uh, next slide. Uh, we want to be served as a, a call for action. Um, our goal is to go beyond raising awareness and moving people towards action. So what we always ask for our participating organizations to do is to organize activities around um, preventing habitat loss or helping with any other threat to migratory birds that might work at their site. And of course, for wetland sites or other water sites, this involves some sort of restoration activity. Um, we also had quite a few plastic pollution cleanups and continue to have them at wetland sites. And we love to see people getting, a, you know, getting out there, getting dirty, um, getting really involved in conservation for migratory birds. Next slide, please. We also create the materials that organizations need to help them raise awareness about some of these threats to migratory birds. And so, for example, uh, during our plastic pollution year, uh, we really went a long way to raising awareness that plastics aren't just an impact to other organisms such as turtles. They're also a, a big impact on migratory birds. Um, next slide. And so all of our materials are engaging. Um, they are designed for youth and adults. They um, include activities. And of course, they always include a variety of habitats where people can put the, put the actions that are recommended to use. We also provide other materials such as a PowerPoint presentation and organizer's guide. Um, during this particular year, we offered cleanup kits and of course, educational materials like this pamphlet. Um, next slide. And the pamphlet, again, um, provides information about the different ways that plastic pollution impacts birds, um, including wetlands and other, other locations where you might find plastics. And again, speaking to our su successes through World Migratory Bird Day, you know, the way that we know that we are successful is that the year after this campaign, um, a number of organizations added uh, plastic pollution to their list of threats to migratory birds and provided ways that people could help to reduce plastic pollution. And next slide. So we invite you to join us. Um, if you're in the Americas or want to reach out to the Americas, these are our contacts uh, for the various parts of the region. And again, thanks to our partners who are actually there in the room. We appreciate the collaboration so much. And um, thank you for being at the meeting and for having us as well virtually. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, so we still have one from Balhua, right? Um, so Connor, I don't know whether we have this. Perfect. Yep, yeah, we do. So um, Balhua from the Mangrove Foundation is going to talk a little bit about uh, what happens at the China Wetland Centers Initiative. So Balhua, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, such a great pleasure to be here to meet all of you. And uh, today I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about the China Environmental Education Center initiative. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just uh, briefly about the, uh, the backgrounds. Well, in China, we have very rich uh, wildland resources. So we have 64 wildlands of international importance, and we have 900 and zero national wildland parks. All of those are very good 
sites for violence for building violence centers to connect, connect people and the uh, wildlands. And then uh, wildland conservation and wise use also requires informed and active public engagement. Yeah, and the wildland education it has been an effective approach for this purpose. Uh, according to this research report uh, of um, wildland conservation by nonprofit environment organizations in China, actually just released this afternoon in Wuhan during the COP conference, uh, wildland education is actually on top of the approaches, the strategies that employed by nonprofit organizations while they are promoting wildland conservation. And uh, also we have already had uh, quite a lot uh, diversified existing SEPA activities and some pretty good wildland education centers, but in consideration of this huge population and the high demand for wildland uh, conservation and wise use, we do need a lot more other than what we have so far. And also there's a lack of systematic approach and a synergy among the various efforts. Uh, so next slide, please. And so since uh, 2018, uh, we started this uh, Wildland Education Center project as a joint initiative uh, of, as part of the Coastal Wildlands Protection Network. Uh, and uh, we have got a lot of support from Chris. Chris is everywhere. <laughs> he actually spent a couple of months in China with us to help de develop all this work. And also uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Xu from the uh, Wally Asia uh, helped us a lot. Really appreciate all this collaboration and your support. Next slide, please. And as a result of this uh, three years project, uh, we were able to compile this guidelines for building wildland centers, uh, which was published earlier this year. And it provided a very good basis for us to move forward to the next step, which, which is the National Wildland Center uh, Initiative. Next slide, please. Okay, maybe click one more. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. And so just a very briefly about what's inside of these guidelines. Uh, so first, definitely we need to have a clear definition and the scope for application. Uh, next, please. And also we would like to be very clear about the principles for building wildland centers. For example, conservation is a high priority. We do all this wildland education or SEPA activities, not for tourism, not for anything else, but for the purpose, the goal of wildland conservation and wise use. And also for public service, experience-based, local-based, and it should be open platform that's open for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. And the second component are the steps for building wildland centers. So we start from defining the vision, mission, and the guiding principles of each wildland center and formulating the learning strategies for, state, for different uh, visitor groups. And also to then the next step is to develop the goals, objectives, and the work plans uh, for each wildland center. And next slide, please. And finally, uh, we identified four uh, major elements for building wildland centers. They are site, uh, educational plans, staff, and uh, sustainable development plan. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to slip it, skip it. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So all of these efforts lead to finally today, actually just earlier in the afternoon in Wuhan, uh, COP, uh, uh, sad event in Wuhan during the COP14, uh, we were uh, uh, officially launched this China Wildland Centers Initiative. And it's a joint initiative by the Department for Wildlands Management of the National Administration for, Forest, uh, for Forestry and Grasslands, and also SE Conservation and Mangrove Foundation. And the goal is to connect the people at the wetlands uh, and promote public 
engagement in wildland conservation through the development of wildland centers across the country. And uh, we have all the nature reserves at the wild and the wildland parks and the nonprofit organizations, schools, and enterpri enterprises to be part of this initiative. Uh, next slide, please. And so there are four components. So we develop the action plan for the development of wildland centers. And uh, we also provide capacity building for various stakeholders. And uh, we try to build this platform for exchange and more communication and also to work on model uh, wildland centers so that it could provide good examples for colleagues to, to learn and to, to, uh, to benefit from. Next slide, please. Okay, and so this is the, just, a, we started the pilot since uh, the end of last year. And uh, after a year's effort, we have been continuously enrolling more uh, wildland parks and wildland nature's, uh, uh, nature reserves to join this in initiative. And so far we have more than 30 wildland nature reserves and more than 10 local NGOs. And I'm sure that this number is increasing, especially after this afternoon, after the initiative was officially launched. And uh, could you please help me to click the link? I will just end with a very short video of a, a joint initiative uh, project this year. So uh, in China, we have this loving birds week uh, every year. Region because birds migrate you know, the, the time in northern China, central China, and the southern China. Oh, they are doing so the activity is about to continue throughout the days of the year. Sorry, those are all in Chinese. Wait, I didn't get a chance to translate it because the, the name list is keep growing. Okay, thank you. Uh, and that's pretty much of my presentation. And uh, I do feel a great honor to be here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for everybody. I would love to keep in touch and uh, learn from each other. And uh, welcome to Shenzhen. We we'll have time to visit us. Thank you. Thank you, Bertha. Excellent. Great to hear what's going on in China. Really exciting stuff. And I know um, you're really committed to a lot of your uh, wetland parks. They're all uh, impressive to see. Right. So the Wetland Star Awards, um, which is where we're going on to next. Um, we're just going to announce uh, a bit of uh, where it came from and then uh, talk about uh, who the winners are of this first round. So, um, Connor, if you want to click through a bit. Um, essentially, uh, we decided that it would be a nice idea to recognize good practice at wetland centers. Um, and so what we did is get together uh, a group of folks from across the globe who were knew about wetland centers in each continent, uh, devised a, a platform for people to uh, apply for this. Uh, they acted as judges. We had uh, 50 applications and we have 23 winners. So now is the moment, I guess, Connor, where we can announce the winners. For 2022 and Connor and I are going to take turns uh, in announcing them. Um, we're going to have a round of applause at the end so don't feel you have to clap after each one you'll have sore hands. Um, great okay so Connor let's go. So first of all the Akrotiri Environmental Education Centre in Cyprus is our first winner we're doing this alphabetically. Um, they had a, a really amazing centre. You can see uh, from that visitor that it's an impressive view. Um, they've done a lot of work with local stakeholders. Uh, there's free admission, so it's open to everyone, and they've reused some excellent um, and sustainable materials in putting their centre together. So we were really impressed with that. Uh, over to you, Connor. So next we go to Biopark Ukumari, uh, which we really loved how much they involved local people and normalized things like sustainability with solar panels in their visitor attraction and the really relevant wetland species work with uh, species, including otters. Congratulations. Next uh, to South Africa and to the Vakastrum Tourism and Education Center. Um, we've known these people for a while and they do excellent stuff 
um, working with young citizen scientists, uh, getting people really involved from a young age uh, in delivering uh, what they do. Uh, and their interpretation materials are something that are excellent and we've shared um, with many other people as well. well so uh, congratulations to Vaka Strum. Via Saru Park, I know they're joining us very late in Sri Lanka. A great community and educational activity that really impressed the judges, their ambition, and most of all, their location there in the capital in an urban sit sit setting. So congratulations to Yasaru. Excellent. Ducks Unlimited Canada. Um, so we're going over to the Oak Hammock Marsh at the Discovery Centre. I think I showed this picture earlier on, an amazingly uh, sensitively designed building uh, in a wetland. Um, given the climate they have there, you know, the winters are pretty harsh, but they've managed to diversify their activities to have people in there pretty much all year round. Um, and during COVID, they, they developed like a, a virtual studio with a green room and everything. Um, so they delivered loads of really brilliant uh, online activities uh, adapting to the COVID situation that we all uh, had to adapt to. So congratulations, Okamak. And congratulations, Evoa. I can see Sandra watching. This is very near the capital of Portugal. It's a really rich visitor experience with different types of accessibility, with the easy mobility options. But also the judges were really struck by how they had materials translated into eight languages, really making the effort in this site. Eight languages, only one less language than I speak. Um, joking. Finneman Nature Park. Um, so we're going down to Nigeria here. Um, we um, really love what they do down here. They do so much work uh, at a local level uh, with local communities. They've done a lot of wetland restoration attached uh, to the wetland centre itself, doing a huge amount uh, with mangroves. So congratulations to Finema. And we've just heard Futian Mangrove Ecological Park, we, where uh, Baohua is is connected with and uh, the judges are really struck by the fantastic role of volunteers in this wetland v visitor center and the different targeted education programs thinking of different types of audience and again a very complicated very unusual uh, urban location definitely uh Guandu uh, nature park um, that seemed really excellent in terms of the activities it was delivering. Uh, when we say hardware and software management, we're talking about the built environment and uh, the team itself, um, but they also make amazing use uh, of uh, technology too, and had some fantastic kind of arts exhibitions in the grounds, um, which really brought a, a different audience no. in for there. So uh, congratulations. Uh, back in Canada, Hilliardon Marsh uh, Research and Education Centre is all about banding birds and they have a great tradition of doing that and using that, literally giving people the chance to hold a bird in the hand in very controlled circumstances. And I'm sure we all understand the power of looking a bird closely in the eye and how that could change you. Um, and best of all, they're in the process of expanding. So congratulations, Hilliardon Marsh. Hunter Wetland Centre in Australia. Um, Hunter is one of the seminal wetland centres, I guess. It's one of the cases of best, best practice that's always cited in the world. Um, it was originally developed from, I think, uh, a waste tip or something. Um, so they've, from that, they've created an amazing, uh, amazing centre. Um, it's entirely volunteer red, so just led in. So incredible what you can do, even if there isn't much budget there. Um, loads of family-friendly activities and great access for people with disabilities as well. So congratulations to Hunter. Come on, yeah. Uh, John Bunker Sands, really interesting use of SEPA at an artificial wetland that is used for pumping water uh, around the whole of North Texas. So a really uh, unusual location and is showing that you can have multifaceted SEPA and you can actually do research in lots of different types of wetlands. Congratulations, John Bunker Sands. And still in the States, then over to the Kansas Wetland Education Center. Um, we've known these guys for a while as well, and they are just incredible in the diversity uh, and imaginative things that they do. Um, during COVID, they did some fantastic uh, virtual tours, which you could go on. Um, the exhibits uh, are really inventive and unusual. Um, they actually presented at our last Welly Asia Oceania meeting, um, and they have some fantastic educational programs to do too. So uh, congratulations, Kansas. La Maison de Lac de Grand Lieu, where I met some of you present on this call for the first time. Uh, uh, unusual in that it's a, there's some very restricted areas of this uh, protected area. 
and they found a way to make those available to people in a really nice manner, making it very beautiful, great accessibility as well. Um, and their mix of public uh, educate public facilities in the exhibits and their school programs all really impressed the judges. Brilliant. Over to Colombia and the Liceo Taller San Miguel. Um, this is a tiny wetland center. It's essentially an outdoor lab uh, for one of the schools there. Um, but Luz Stella, who runs the program, is always providing us with excellent examples of what they're doing with the kids in the wetland. Um, and uh, I think, I'm not sure if Luz Stella is online. Pero yes, she yes. is. Hola, Luz. Perfecto. Entonces, si estás, Luz Stella, estamos tan contentos de trabajar contigo porque tiene un proyecto tan uh, increíble que sí, es siempre un placer tener tus noticias. I hope no one speaks Spanish here, because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pero gracias y un abrazo grande a, para ti y para los niños. Um, and I've, sorry, skipped a little bit too early. Yes, hola Luz, um, to Naturum Fattenricket in Sweden, another center which really impressed us. Uh, really beautiful setting and, and construction. The way they support their volunteers, we know that's super important for what we do. And that was a, a really impressed the judges, the diverse activities and the accessibility, like we see in this photograph, using audio tours to serve people in different situations. So congratulations, uh, Naturum Fattenricket. Great. Um, and then uh, down south to the New Zealand National Wetland Centre. This is actually a wetland centre without a visitor centre, but it still contains many of the elements that's important to a wetland centre. Uh, they have great interpretation and boardwalks already. Um, they're working very closely with local indigenous communities and they do a lot about bringing people uh, into the site. Uh, and they have big hopes for developing a wetland centre uh, when funding allows. So uh, congratulations to you guys. And now the OCT wetland, again, a really novel situate location. This is within a housing development in the city of Shenzhen. And we see they've actually used um, the existing structures. So old watchtowers, they've turned into bird watching towers. And in a small area, they have one of China's smallest um, uh, national wetland parks. And they still have managed to put in really impressive interpretation. So an inspirational approach from a uh, residential development. Definitely over to Shanghai Chongming Dongtan National Nature Reserve. Um, you can see their extensive marshland here um, with boardwalks throughout it. Um, they also have some great uh, exhibit centers and buildings actually in the marsh itself. So you really feel like uh, you're on there. Uh, they're a really important site to the flyway uh, and one of the best known, I think, uh, wetland centers in China. So congratulations, Chongming Dongtan. Sydney Olympic Park Wetland Education Centre. Again, we were really struck by how people have used an urban location to reach different audiences and then make it accessible in lots of different ways, including with digital tools and a sensory trail and really considering different types of audiences and helping them to uh, helping to reach them with their CEPA work. So congratulations. The Punta Pia Wildlife well, Fowl Trust um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Again, these guys have been going uh, nearly as long as we have. Um, so a great history of delivering stuff uh, for local communities. They've got a fantastically accessible site and they do lots of great um, programs for people, particularly with uh, special needs. So uh, that's excellent. And they're also working well uh, with a local industry as well. So that partnership uh, is a nice way of demonstrating that uh, social responsibility. The Upo Ecology Education Institute, I believe Miss Kim, is in the room. Congratulations. Our judges were really struck by how, again, you took a unique situation and really made the most of it, training teachers and giving a really broad range of activities and reaching broader audiences than other centres might, and also incorporating great accessibility. Really impressive. Congratulations. And last but not least, uh, our very own WWT Wellney Weapons Center. Uh, you can see one of the heights here, but actually the center itself uh, is beautifully designed uh, and extremely sustainable uh, in uh, its construction. Uh, it's very famous uh, for the Hooper Swans that come every year. And it's uh, if you ever find yourself uh, in uh, East Anglia in the UK, then come and see it. It's a, it's a sight to behold. Um, but throughout the year, they're doing great work. Uh, with local communities and schools. So congratulations uh, to WWC Wellney as well. So uh, thanks to everybody. Congratulations to everybody. Let's give them a round of applause.
and I know, um, but, but time is short. Um, so what we're going to do is invite representatives uh, to pick up their plaques at the front here. Um, and Sarah is going to help me to hand those out. Uh, and Vivian is going to take some pictures, I think, as well, hopefully. So could all of those people who uh, we've spoken to about coming and picking up the plaques, please come to the front and we will take uh, a group picture with everybody and their plaques. Thank you very much. Can I just tell them the order they are? Like this? Yeah, do you want to just like, hand them to me? Thank you for staying with us, everyone. I know it was a long, it was a long session and we were a tiny bit late, but I really appreciate being with us. We just had such a short amount of time. We couldn't do justice, of course, to every centre. You all impressed us um, right, in so many so ways. Hola, hola, Danapuri. I wish I spoke more Spanish. If any of you want to speak Spanish, would like to say hello to the kids. Hello, we're listening. Hello. Hello. Hola, Conor. Aprendió un español perfecto. Gracias, Luisa. Buena profesora. Buena profesora. Muy paciente. Okay. I cheat. I use an online translator. We have the space come and hit those guys up. So if you want to ask me on the excellent. so who do you have next? So you can remember. Hunter Wenton Center. Hunter Wenton Center. Congratulations. Uh, if you'd like to sign that. So we can get everybody in. Uh, Bill That's Colombia. Congratulations. Okay, point of care work. I'll trust uh, Trinidad and Tobago. We don't have uh, let's have to pick this up. Sorry, we're just uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So that's our okay. camera, and we also have Hilton. Perfect. Brilliant. You okay with two? Yeah, so when we got to the end, I'm going to ask you all to jump up on the stage, okay, for, to make some space. So, New Zealand National Weapons Centre. Brilliant, thank you. Do you want to come up there? 
Uh, the Deer Saddle Park, uh, Sri Lanka. Can I ask you to start a new line? Um, and hopefully, we'll get everyone. Finema Nature Park. Do we have a red Finema Nature Park? I'm not sure that we do. Just have to be me, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, please. Okay. WWC Wellness Wellness Centre. Who can it be? <laughs> Uh, Pakistan, uh, so South Africa, do we know South Africa? <laughs> 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 I'm sure we do. <laughs> Just Okay, so Shanghai, Chongming. Yeah. Like the bridge was the police check. Great, the perfect thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the treat you get here. Right, Tim Smith, my Chinese lets me. <laughs> Sorry, then we have to and we have a Fujian one as well. Yeah. 
<laughs> Don't break it so both. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And so there's still time if anyone wants to have individual pictures or anything else that will stick around for a bit. There might still be some time here outside if you like it. But thank you very much and congratulations, everyone. Congratulations, everyone.